I want to speak to you about uh, a number of things, but I want to begin with this uh, kind of premise. Uh, asked me to kind of uh, push people's thinking a little, be, be provocative, think out of the box with you. You may think I'm just out of my mind, uh, but uh, this is supposed to be out of the box. So wh where I want to start is just fixing a factory or a school isn't going to prepare today's students for the 21st century. Um, a quote from one of my colleagues, Kathleen Fulton, that I like is that uh, the problem with the schools we have today is that they are the schools we had yesterday. Okay. And the corollary to that is that the problem with schools of education today is that they were designed to prepare teachers for the schools we had yesterday. And as long as they keep doing that, we'll continue to have the schools we had yesterday. We're going to have to not tinker with this problem. We're going to have to not work on fixing this problem. We have to change our business model, our operating model, in some very fundamental ways. We're, we need to do that, first of all, because we need to create 21st century schools. To do that, we need a 21st century workforce. And I'm going to be speaking a lot about a 21st century education workforce, not just about individual teachers. 21st century teachers will be at the core of this workforce, but this workforce needs to look very different than the workforce we've had in the past. The reason we need to make these changes is that we're in a new era. We're in an era that I call the learning age. We're in an era in which School is no longer the place to learn to do the job. It's no longer job preparation. <coughs> Learning is the job. Our students today, uh, in their future, learning will be part of every aspect of their lives, from the work they do to citizen participation to their own personal growth and development. We are in the learning age. And I make a distinction between the learning age and the information age because in too many cases people are thinking information age, well that's all about high tech, uh, cutting edge science. Uh, every job that a student is likely to do in the future is going to be a learning job. A carpenter, a plumber, or electrician, a nurse, any, any job that a student does going forward is going to require learning on a constant basis, collaborative problem solving, uh, and our schools need to start to look like those learning places where they're going to work for the rest of their lives. To make those schools look like that, we need to transform them from teaching organizations into learning organizations. Right now we have teaching organizations. You all know the kind of teacher-centric model of schools. We need to move into learning organizations, learning organizations in which every learner is moving at their own progression, learning in their own style, learning at their own pace. And by the way, that means every learner, which includes every teacher as a learner, uh, growing and developing professionally, so that the learning organization is a learning place for everyone, not just the students, but also the teachers. And you note that I no longer call it a school because it's a learning space. Okay? We're going to be talking about learning organizations that are a network, an ecosystem of learning spaces. Uh, school is no longer the place to learn. School is just one place to learn in, an, in a network learning environment, an ecosystem of learning opportunities. And the job of educators in the future, this workforce that we're going to develop, is going to be managing, developing, facilitating uh, that learning network. These changes are going to come quickly. Uh, they're already underway in, in sectors outside of education, ironically. The larger workforce is already uh, transforming itself into active learning organizations. And schools are kind of coming from behind on this transition. There are several forces that are going to push this transformation to occur more rapidly. The first is this one. We heard a little bit about this last night in the presentation about aging education workforce around the world. 
In the United States in 2004, this chart is depicting the age distribution of teachers in the United States. What we have is a workforce that is 53% boomers, an education workforce that's 53% boomers, 53% of the teachers. These teachers now, this was 2004, 2008, the youngest boomer is 45, the, the oldest boomers are 63. Okay. So we built uh, a teaching model largely with this group of people. They were, they were the core of our education workforce uh, for over 30 years. In uh, the 70s, when these folks entered, we had the youngest workforce in our history, the youngest teaching workforce in our history. The modal age was in the low uh, 30s. Uh, by 76, uh, we, this, this bulge had arrived in our schools. We now have the oldest workforce we've had in our history. Okay. And those folks are exiting. That's half of our teachers. They're exiting if we let them go. And behind them is a lot of churn. Uh, teachers who come in early in the career who don't stay the way that the boomers stay. We have 30% of teachers leave after the first five years, leave the profession, and even more move from a school to another school. So there's a lot of choppy churn at the front end. So the, the initial uh, reaction looking at this is to say, well, no problem, we're just going to recruit our way out of this. And that's what we're already seeing. People forecasting now, they're saying, we used to say we need to hire two million teachers in ten years. Now we're saying we need to hire a million and a half teachers in five years. Okay? Uh, that's not going to happen. You know, and just replacing a million and a half veterans with uh, beginners is not a good bet in terms of sustaining teaching quality. Uh, the top 10 or 20 percent of these uh, boomers, for example, probably include our most accomplished educators in the country. We can't afford to have them just walk away and uh, be replaced by people who are not experienced. On the other hand, we know that we have a bright young generation of educators coming into the classroom, digital age teachers, uh, millennials, people in their 20s. Uh, I'm, I'm always struck because I was involved with uh, starting the challenge grants in the 90s, 94, 95. We were doing all these projects with uh, middle school teachers and high school teachers. Teachers were struggling. The students were getting it faster than the, the teachers were, okay? Those students who were the middle school students then are the entering teachers now, okay? And, and they are digital age teachers. So. Not only can we not afford to have uh, the most accomplished veterans leave, but we can't afford to continue to have that churn among young teachers because those are the people who have the innovative thinking, the uh, proficiency with technology that we need to really transform our schools. This is the other end of that career continuum. It's not all about retirement. The blue line is retirement. The gold line is teachers who leave for non-retirement reasons. Non-retirement leavers out, out in the areas by three to one. Now this blue line has been rising because of boomer retirements and it will continue to rise, but it's not rising any, anywhere near as steeply as the non-retirement leavers. So we have something basically that's not sustainable. We're losing uh, this industrial era career pipeline is collapsing at both ends. We're losing talent at both ends of the career. We're losing accomplished veterans. We're lo losing bright young beginning teachers. It's just not a sustainable workforce model. So we've had a lot of talk recently about managing the human capital more effectively, how to, how to manage them. We need to move to a very different workforce model. This is happening in industry. It's uh, some folks like the folks at Deloitte 
Touche are, are talking about mass career customization. Uh, that 